Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the 10th anniversary of Cinematic Excrement. <laughs> the hell was that? Look, I know this is a low-budget show, but if we're going to rely on free sound effects, could we at least pick something that fits? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Are you kidding? Oh, never mind. Well, if you've just joined the party today, welcome. If you've been with me for the last 10 years, what can I say except... Holy shit, really? I mean, I'm grateful, really, thank you, but... I went back and watched episode 1 recently, and Jesus Christ could I have been more awkward. I like to think I've gotten better over the years, but if you've stuck with me since day 1, you must have infinite patience. Bless you. Anyway, some of you are no doubt wondering why we're celebrating the 10th anniversary today when the actual 10th anniversary was back in November. Well, the answer is really quite simple. I forgot. I wish I had a better answer for you, but it really is that lame. I had no idea it was the 10th anniversary until someone else pointed it out to me. Lord help me if I ever get married. So I've been trying to figure out just what I should review for the 10th anniversary. I suppose I could do a legendary So Bad It's Good movie, like Troll 2 or perhaps another Ed Wood film, but I thought that would be too obvious. I could do the Star Wars prequels, but what can I possibly say that hasn't already been said by Red Letter Media? And I'm already doing the Razzie Worst Picture winners, so that's out. And I know I haven't given Fifty Shades Freed the full treatment yet, but... It's Fifty Shades. What else is there to say at this point? The movies are all the same. Honestly, I'm just glad they didn't follow the trend of splitting the last chapter into two parts. Ultimately, I thought I needed to do something that I haven't done in a while. I need to do something fun. But not just fun. Something with a personal connection. Something from my childhood. So with that in mind... Cowabunga, dudes and dudettes! We're taking a trip back to the 90s with the first live-action adaptations of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, before Michael Bay got his grubby little hands on them. And yes, I said adaptations. We're doing all three. This is my 10th anniversary. I can't waste it on just one movie. But before we dive into the movies, let me tell you a little bit about my experience with this long-running franchise. My first introduction to the pizza-loving, ninja-fighting green machines, Leonardo, Raphael, Michelangelo, and Donatello, was back in 1987 with the original cartoon series. And let me tell you, young Sean ate that shit up. It was silly, it was action-packed, it had all manner of colorful characters, it had a catchy theme song, it frequently broke the fourth wall. Is it any wonder I turned out the way I did considering I grew up watching this? I love this show so much, but even I'll admit it wasn't perfect. Like pretty much any cartoon back then, there were often mistakes with the animation. Sometimes the turtle's masks would be the wrong color. Sometimes the animators would have the wrong character speak a given line. Ain't you up on current events, lady? We just saved your life! And then you'd have shit like this, where you'd somehow end up with two Leonardos, two Raphaels, one Donatello, and no Michelangelo. What in God's name even happened here? This was not at all uncommon in the 80s. Children's cartoons were quickly and cheaply produced with relatively simple stories and were basically just 30-minute toy commercials. That's not to say there was no effort put into them at all. Of course there was. And Ninja Turtles does look better than most 80s cartoons, but it was still constrained by the standards and technology of the time. Kids today have no idea how spoiled they are. Sure, some shows are still 30-minute toy commercials, but they have high-quality animation and actual character development and some really compelling stories. I mean, have you seen the stuff they've done with Della Duck in the DuckTales reboot? That's enough to make a grown man cry. No grown man ever cried during Ninja Turtles back in the day, I can tell you that, but I digress. Like I said, I was a huge fan of the cartoon. I never missed an episode. I had a huge collection of action figures, which I don't have anymore because I eventually outgrew them and sold them at a garage sale. It's too bad, really. They'd probably be worth a pretty penny on eBay. But anyway, several of my friends were fans as well. And when we heard they were making a Ninja Turtles movie, we could not have been more excited. And our little minds were blown when we found out it would be live action instead of a cartoon. That was even the tagline on the poster. Hey dude, this is no cartoon. We were beyond stoked. We bought our tickets. Well, okay, our parents bought our tickets. We were nine. We sat in that theater, and when the Heroes in a Half Shell leapt out of the shadows, it was just about the coolest thing we'd ever seen. And looking back on this almost 30 years later, those costumes actually hold up pretty well. 
But I guess that shouldn't come as a surprise considering they were designed by Jim Henson Studios. I don't think anyone else could have produced costumes with this level of quality, as evidenced by the third film, but we'll get to that. Henson himself wasn't a fan of the movie due to the level of violence, which I suppose I can understand, even though it's pretty tame by today's standards. But regardless of how he felt about the film itself, I hope he and his team were proud of the work they did bringing the turtles to life on the big screen. And the fight choreography was amazing, especially considering the actors had to do all of these moves while wearing these huge 70-pound animatronic suits. That cannot have been easy, and the fact that the fight scenes look as good as they do is a testament to their skill level. Bravo! Of course, nothing like this would ever be made today, and honestly, that's perfectly fine. Computer animation has advanced so much in recent years that it would be foolish to try to make a TMNT movie without it. And I don't begrudge the Michael Bay movies for making use of this technology. I begrudge them for many reasons, but the use of CGI is not one of them. Anyway, nine-year-old me enjoyed this movie very much, but it wasn't quite what I expected. My only exposure to the TMNT franchise at this point was the very silly and kid-friendly cartoon. Little did I know the true origins of these characters. As I'm sure most of you are aware, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles originated as a black and white comic book created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. It was written as a parody slash homage of other comics at the time and spoofed quite a few elements from Daredevil. For example, Daredevil's mentor was a man called Stick. The Turtles' mentor was a rat called Splinter. Stick, Splinter, get it? Eastman and Laird originally intended the comic to be a one-off. Hell, they killed off the Turtles' main antagonist, the Shredder, at the end of that first issue. In Laird's own words, nothing about it was planned beyond how do we make a 40-page comic and make it halfway decent. The first printing was 3,000 issues, and they certainly didn't expect to sell more than that. They weren't doing this for fame and fortune, they did it for fun. But the pre-orders for issue 2 were five times that amount. TMNT ended up becoming so popular that not only did Eastman and Laird continue creating comics and started their own company, Mirage, they spawned a multimedia franchise that is still going strong to this day. There have been four animated series and six movies, with the seventh in the works. There was also a live-action TV show, but we... don't talk about that. And of course, toys and video games and various other products. Merchandising, merchandising. That silly little comic book grew beyond their wildest dreams. And it's interesting that the comic spawned a very kid-friendly cartoon, considering the comic itself was, well, not. It was pretty solidly in PG-13 territory. The turtles cussed, they drank beer, and they racked up a body count. Hell, after they defeat Shredder in the first issue, Leonardo tells him to take his sword and commit seppuku to regain his honor. Not exactly kid-friendly. In fact, the more I look at some of the early issues of the comic, the more I wonder how anyone could have looked at this and thought, Oh yeah, we can make a kid show out of that, no problem. Then again, they did make toys based on aliens and Robocop, so I guess they'll market anything to kids. But anyway, when New Line Cinema, at the time a small, relatively unknown studio, set out to bring the Turtles to the big screen, the comics were their main inspiration. They did keep some elements from the cartoon. The Turtles' friend, April O'Neil, is still a TV news reporter instead of a lab assistant for mad scientist Baxter Stockman. The Turtles are somehow able to disguise themselves with hats and trench coats. And some of the humor carried over as well, mainly with Michelangelo's personality. <laughs> But the movie bears a stronger resemblance to the comics. Its tone is darker, its lighting is darker, the violence is less cartoonish, mostly. And they threw in some PG-level swearing. Damn! When I first saw the movie, I think that's what shocked me more than anything. Not the violence or the darker tone, but... Ooh! Raphael said a swear! Again, I was nine. And I had a very sheltered childhood. The Turtles' origin story in the movie follows the comics pretty closely with a few minor changes. A man named Hamato Yoshi, his wife Tang Shen, and their pet rat Splinter move from Japan to... Uh, New York City. New York City! Yes, yes. To escape a man named Oroku Saki, who was jealous of Yoshi and wanted Shen for himself. Unfortunately, it didn't end well for them as Saki actually followed Yoshi and Shen to New York and killed them. Splinter valiantly tried to avenge his master, but wasn't able to do much more than scratch Saki's face since he was, you know, a rat. And in exchange, Saki took his ear. And now that I'm able to look back on this as an adult, it's kind of dumb, right? I mean, putting aside the fact that Saki had no qualms about murdering two human beings, but spared the rat's life, 
Are we really meant to believe he traveled across a freaking ocean to murder two people purely out of jealousy? Yeah, jealousy can make people do stupid shit, but would it be worth the Trans-Pacific airfare? Come on. This played out slightly different in the comics as it was actually Saki's brother Nagi who was jealous of Shen and Yoshi. Ultimately, Yoshi ended up killing Nagi in self-defense and they fled to New York. Meanwhile, Saki rose in the ranks of the criminal enterprise known as the Foot Clan and was chosen to go to New York to start the American branch of the Foot. And while he was there, he got his revenge on Yoshi for killing his brother. See, traveling halfway across the world to avenge your murdered brother? That I get. And it's not like he had to go out of his way to do it. His job was already sending him to New York City anyway. Well, as long as I'm here, might as well get revenge. Stab, stab, stab. Yeah, it's silly. But in its own way, it at least makes sense. Taking Oroku Naki out of the equation just makes the whole thing kind of dumb. Where did they come up with this stuff? Well, moving on, Splinter eventually found four turtles crawling around in a strange glowing ooze, and he gathered them up and basically adopted them as his sons. It turns out the ooze was some sort of mutagen that caused Splinter and the turtles to grow much larger and more intelligent. So he did the only logical thing. He trained them in the art of ninjutsu, which he learned by mimicking his master Yoshi, and named them after his favorite renaissance artists. I mean, what else are you gonna do when you find four baby turtles crawling around in mutagen and your master was just murdered by the leader of a criminal ninja clan? I would have done the same thing, I don't know about you. Fast forward 15 years and the Foot Clan is now operating in New York as a group of ninja thieves led by a mysterious individual known as the Shredder, played by James Saito. And they have begun recruiting the city's juvenile delinquents to its cause, but I can't say I like their methods. I mean, it takes five guys to steal one wallet? Come on, Shredder. Even for gangs of ninja thieves, efficiency is important. And it looks like their hideout is basically just a video arcade. This doesn't seem like much of an evil lair to me. It's really just a dimly lit Dave and Busters. And this is such a comically sanitized depiction of a youth gang. The worst thing we see anyone here doing is smoking. That's it. It's unhealthy, but if that's all they're doing, they ain't that bad. And it's not really clear how this happens, but I guess at some point they graduate from juvenile delinquent to ninja thief apprentice, and they're trained by Shredder's second-in-command, Tatsu, played by Toshishiro Obata, who is legitimately a champion swordsman, though we never see Tatsu with a sword in the movie. Well, talk about a wasted opportunity. You mean we could have had a sword-wielding Tatsu this whole time? My inner child feels cheated. The turtles have been fighting the foot from the shadows, and while they mostly avoid coming in contact with humans in broad daylight for obvious reasons, they do eventually gain a handful of human allies. First, there's Casey Jones, a sports-loving masked vigilante who initially has a disagreement of sorts with Raphael, but then he joins forces with the turtles because... Um... I guess he had nothing better to do? I mean, in the comics, Raph and Casey developed a mutual respect after their fight, but that's not really what happens here. Casey spots Raph and the Turtles fighting the Foot Clan and joins in because... reasons. Even as a kid, that didn't make much sense to me. Then there's Danny, played by Michael Turney, who starts out as one of Shredder's juvenile delinquents. But after the Foot Clan kidnaps Splinter and Danny has a couple of heart-to-hearts with the wise old rat, he realizes, hey, maybe working with a criminal enterprise run by a guy who dresses like this isn't the best idea. So he stopped working with the evil ninjas because a rat showed him a better way. Have I mentioned this movie is a bit silly? And of course, there's April O'Neil, played by Judith Hoke, who I may or may not have had a crush on at the time. And fortunately, she did not have to wear that yellow jumpsuit of her animated counterpart. According to Hogue, the jumpsuit was the original plan, but they did a really half-assed job and basically just took an already hideous white jumpsuit and dyed it yellow. And it was so ugly, the producers tossed it, and the only yellow she wore was a raincoat. You know, I'm kinda curious just how bad that jumpsuit must have looked. Was it as bad as the model on the arcade cabinet? Because if so, I'd say she dodged a bullet. April is doing her best to expose the threat posed by the Foot Clan. The Shredder, who apparently spends his free time watching the same channel on 50 freaking TVs, is not happy about this. Find her. It seems that somebody ought to. Silence her. He really doesn't respond well to negative media coverage. Oh my god. Shredder is Mike Pompeo! Eventually, the evil ninjas ambush April in a New York City subway station, which is somehow completely empty in the middle of the day. What? We've been waiting for you, Miss O'Neill. What? Am I behind on my Sony payments again? <laughs> <laughs> That's racist. 
Fortunately, Raf saves her and brings her back to their hideout in the sewers, and he introduces April to the rest of the family. Considering she's never met mutant animals before, she takes it pretty well. <laughs> I'm amazed she's able to scream at all and isn't just constantly heaving from the smell. They are in the sewers, after all. I don't care if the turtles have been dousing the shit out of that lair with Febreze. That place has got to smell like 20 tons of New York ass. Anyway, the climax of the movie comes when the turtles fight Shredder on a rooftop, similar to their encounter in the comic. And while Shredder hasn't done much in the movie until this point, he turns out to be the turtles' biggest threat as he easily thrashes all four of them. And I love this fight. Up until now, the turtles, when fighting together, have had a relatively easy go of it. There was one fight where Raph got his ass handed to him, but that's only because he had to fight a shitload of ninjas on his own and was overwhelmed. This is the first time the turtles look like they've actually met their match, and it makes for an awesome showdown. Ultimately, it's not the turtles, but Splinter who saves the day, as Shredder is in fact revealed to be his old master's murderer, Orokusaki, and Splinter tosses him off the roof into a garbage truck. Oops! Oops, I just murdered a guy! Wasn't that fun, kids? Overall, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is a very flawed movie. The story doesn't make a whole lot of sense, the movie has a very cheap look to it, at times the movie seems a bit too grown up for its target audience, but at other times it's too childish for anyone older than the target audience. And they did make a few visual mistakes here and there. Now some of the mistakes you may have seen in other videos aren't necessarily mistakes, as they were only visible on the old full-screen home video release, since the movie was filmed in open matte and then cropped for widescreen when it went to theaters. I've already gone over this process in my Plan 9 from Outer Space review, and I'm not going to repeat myself too much here. Suffice to say, I'm only counting it as a mistake if it is visible in the widescreen version. That being said, there are still a few visible mistakes in the widescreen version. Every once in a while, you can see the faces of the actors inside the turtle costumes, like this shot of Donatello. Check it out. There's another mouth inside his mouth. He looks like a freaking xenomorph. And then there's this shot where a crew member is clearly visible crouched behind this table. That one blows my mind. How did the director not spot the dude in the bright red ball cap? Judging by other reviews of this movie, Everyone else did. Damn it, Carl, get out of the shot! And some of the jokes really do not land. There's a scene where Casey Jones is clearly apprehensive about spending the night in a goddamn sewer, and Donatello suggests Casey might be a claustrophobic. And Casey's reaction to this is, well... Never even looked at another guy before. Whoa, hold all of the phones. Does Casey think claustrophobic means... gay? I, why would just, that, that doesn't make any sense. How does he confuse claustrophobic with homosexual? The words don't even sound alike. That'd be like saying, what do you mean I'm a narcoleptic? I can see color just fine. It makes about as much sense. I don't even know if that's necessarily homophobic, at least not overtly so. Really, it's just stupid. Anyway, I wouldn't exactly call Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles a good movie, but as a wise man once said, movies don't necessarily have to be good to be awesome. And it is awesome. Awesome! Like I said before, the fight scenes are incredibly well done and the costumes look amazing, and they did a great job of not only making the turtles feel like brothers, but giving them all distinct personalities. Even though they all have their own colored headbands, you don't need them to tell the turtles apart. The acting is on the campy side, especially the voice acting for Shredder and Tatsu, as Saito and Obata did not supply their own voices. Hell, Shredder is basically this movie's Darth Vader. I am your father like I said. But it's a story about mutant turtles fighting evil ninjas. If it ain't campy, you ain't doing it right. It was exactly what this movie needed, and the actors all did the job they were supposed to do. And you might recognize a couple of the voices. Michelangelo was voiced by Robbie Rist, the former cousin Oliver from The Brady Bunch, and Donatello? That's Corey Feldman. And apart from that stupid-ass claustrophobic joke, most of the humor works pretty well. I still remember the bit at the beginning of the movie where the turtles are all shouting random 90s slang like awesome, bodacious, gnarly, and so on. It was the early 90s, we all talk like that. And I assure you, we are embarrassed. And Donnie tries to come up with his own slang, and it doesn't go well. Bossa Nova! What? Yeah? 
Bossa Nova? Chevy Nova? That is such a classic bit. Sure, it's corny, but I love it. And some of the more emotional moments also work well. One that stands out to me is when the turtles are gathered around a campfire and manage to telepathically reach out to Splinter, who is held captive by the Foot Clan at this time. This was their first confirmation that he was, in fact, still alive. And at the end, Mikey appears to be hit the hardest as he's the only one who actually tears up. And this ties into an earlier moment in the film where Splinter is talking with the turtles about how he won't be around forever and they need to accept the fact that one day, they'll be on their own. Fast forward a bit, and Donnie and Mikey are waiting around for the pizza delivery guy, and Donnie asks Mikey what he thinks about what Splinter said earlier. I mean, about what it would be like. You know, not having him. Hmm. Time's up. Three bucks off. I guess Domino's gave you a discount if they weren't there in 30 minutes, or at least that's how it works in the movie. Whatever. At first glance, it may seem like Mikey is just being an absent-minded goof. It certainly wouldn't be the first time. But based on his reaction at the campfire, I think there's more going on here. Maybe I'm overthinking this, although I don't think I'm the first to suggest this theory, so if I am overthinking it, at least I'm not alone. But I think the idea of life without Splinter is something Mikey is not emotionally prepared for. So when Donnie tries to bring it up, Mikey simply shrugs it off to avoid having to talk about it. But when they have their vision of Splinter at the campfire, Mikey becomes overwhelmed and all that pent-up emotion just comes out. It's a great scene on its own, but when put in context with that earlier scene, even more so. Not what I expected from a silly movie about fighting turtles. Like I said, it's not necessarily a good movie, but it works well as a Ninja Turtles movie, and it's a lot of fun. And if you're a fan of the turtles, it's definitely worth a watch. And the movie was a huge hit, raking in over $200 million at the box office on a $13 million budget. So naturally, a sequel was pretty much guaranteed. And we'll talk about that in part two.